welcome all and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Michael Downey and it's great to be back for another AWRI webinar. The AWRI released six sessions, six new sessions last month and registration is open now for each of these sessions. There's some fantastic content on the horizon, including today's, which takes a look at undervine cover crops. Now, before we jump in and make a start, a couple of quick reminders for anyone new to AWRI webinars to provide a comment or to ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send them through. We will be running a dedicated Q&A at the end of these presentations, but please feel free to shoot through your questions at any stage. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to view later this afternoon from the AWRI's YouTube channel. For those of you that have just joined, welcome. Today's webinar provides insights into benefits associated with undervine cover cropping. It's fantastic to have three project members from the University of Adelaide to share results and findings from this project and discuss implications for growers. First up, we'll hear from Professor Tim Cavagnaro, who will lay the groundwork for this session. Tim is a professor of ecology in the School of Agriculture food and wine and has a strong focus on discovering methods to manage soil ecological processes to achieve agricultural and environmental sustainability. So Tim, it's great to have your expertise on board uh, and to provide an introduction to the topic and some context around the project. Um, so if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. Great, thank you, Michael. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here speaking today and, and hello to everyone in the audience. Um, and I'd like to start off by thanking the AWRI for um, inviting us to present this session today. We're, we're really excited about this, to be talking about our work on the, the ins and outs of undervine cover cropping. So as, as Michael mentioned, there are a number of us speaking today and I'll start off with a quick introduction to the, the broader context of undervine management. And then I'll hand over to uh, Chris Penfold who will talk about site establishment, species selection, and then Tom Lyons will speak to us about data collection and some key findings from our, our current project. And then we'll open up to a, a panel discussion. I always like to start a presentation with the most important slide of all, and that is the acknowledgements rather than putting them at the end. So I'd really very sincerely like to thank Wine Australia for supporting and funding this research. We've really enjoyed the opportunity to do this work. We'd also like to thank the owners and managers of our field sites, both in the Barossa and Langhorn Creek for their support and ongoing openness to hosting our work. I'd also like to thank our um, collaborators, uh, Vinay Paggy, and also uh, Jake Howie and Joe Marks, who have also assisted with the research. And of course, the University of Adelaide for supporting us in our work as well. So today's discussion is concerned with undervine management. And so when I say that, I'm really talking about this zone here immediately beneath the vine. So we're not talking about the mid row, we're talking about this vegetated space over here on the left, or this area over here where the vegetation's been cleared. And we're looking at different options for managing this undervine zone and trying to explore and understand the mechanisms that underlie the impacts of those different management strategies. So traditionally, this zone was denuded of vegetation and there were, there were good rationales for doing that. And some of the, the pros for this sort of scorched earth approach where we're really trying to eliminate any vegetation under vine was around trying to um, avoid competition between the vines and any vegetation that may exist under the vine for things like water and nutrients. And so that was really the rationale for trying to keep this, this area clear of vegetation. There's been a bit of a shift in thinking in, in recent years, and we'll, we'll discuss some of that in a, in a few moments, really thinking about some of the broader implications of having this vegetation here or removing it. So by maintaining vegetation under the vine, we're potentially increasing not only the biodiversity above ground, but also the biodiversity below ground. And so we're really interested in the impacts on things like earthworms and soil microbiome and so on. There's also some really um, quite exciting results that we'll present today looking at the impacts of having this vegetation underneath the vines in terms of the availability of water and nutrients to the vines. Another rationale for trying to move away from this um, completely cleared zone underneath the vine is to reduce the reliance on herbicides. So obviously the um, 
the, the consumer and regulators have concerns around herbicides, there's also concerns around health and safety and using some of those fairly potent chemicals. And so that's another rationale for thinking about perhaps avoiding that management practice. There might also be some implications of having vegetation under the vine in terms of soil temperature and canopy temperature as well. And more broadly, the impacts of removing the vegetation and what that does to the soil health and microbiomes as well. So the overall aim of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years is to provide currently lacking mechanistic knowledge on the impacts of undervine cover crops. And so in order to answer that question or to explore that question, we've been comparing conventional management, as you see on the right hand side of the slide, to treatments where we've got grasses growing, where we've got nitrogen fixing um, plants growing, native grasses, mixtures of plants and mulch as well. So it's really quite a comprehensive assessment of these different vineyard floor management practices under the, the vine. I think it's important to take a moment and think about what success looks like in this context. Obviously, we can look at impacts on yield and we can look at impacts on the, the metrics, um, the berry metrics and the berry chemistry and also wine character characteristics. But success in this context also has um, a relationship to things like, is there greater microbial diversity? There's much more awareness of the importance of soil microbiomes and soil health. And so are there impacts of these different treatments on soil health? Um, are there impacts on important invertebrates in the system? So is, is there an impact on the biomass of the earthworms? If we're growing a nitrogen fixing cover crop underneath the vines, perhaps we're getting more mineral nitrogen through the, the nitrogen fixation. Impacts on water are, are quite complex and very interesting because they might have an impact on the um, things like vintage compression as well. And more broadly, if we're having an impact on soil temperature and canopy temperature, that can have a, a really important um, potential role to play in adaptive capacity in terms of, of climate change. And of course, another element here to consider is the um, amount of carbon that you might be potentially sequestering if you've got plants growing under the vine. And that's something that's being explored in a, a PhD project that's supported by Wine Australia um, by Joseph Marks. So I'm sure we'll hear from Joe in, in years to come about his results as well. So I'm going to finish up there. I just wanted to provide the broad context and now I'll hand over to Chris um, and he'll talk to us about the site establishment and species selection. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tim. Next up we have Chris Penfold. Chris is a return speaker for the AWRI webinar program and many of you may remember his presentation regarding the benefits of cover cropping from 2018. Chris brings extensive experience as a researcher in viticulture with a focus on promoting sustainability uh, through investigating non-chemical weed control, undervine uh, management and cover cropping systems. Today, Chris will discuss the site establishment and species selection components of this project. Chris, I'll um, hand it over to you to make a start. Thank you, Michael, and thank you all for, for attending today and for your interest in this work. Um, given that, um, you, you're probably pretty aware already of some of this introductory material which I'm going to be talking about. I guess essentially what we are trying to do with this project is to be able to provide some alternatives to, to you as growers as to how you might move away from that, that bare undervine strip to replacing that with um, what would have been once weeds that might have been growing there with preferred species which are going to provide benefit to your vines and at the same time be able to provide competition with other weeds which might want to emerge in that area and so you're left with a, a zone there of preferred species there and the reasons for doing this I've sort of outlined here we are by removing that uh, vegetation constantly uh, impacting on our soil quality Structure biology, we're reducing organic carbon levels by doing that, just by not having things growing there. It all comes at a cost in doing that with, um, with the, the price of the herbicides and application and so on. There is real concerns these days from the litigation perspective on OHS and the, the herbicides we're using now for, for knockdowns, and you're all aware of what's been happening in the glyphosate regime. You've probably seen the glufosinate label these days, um, which is um, uh, rather concerning that people might be using it and also the paraquat dicol we've known about for a long time and its uh, implications for OHS. There's also a lot of resistant weeds out there which some of you probably have had to deal with 
can we get around those with just providing competition from preferred species instead? Um, access to herbicides and markets, and I think that's a, an important one, particularly looking at EU and so on, as to um, what they are, the way they are going at the moment, which is away from herbicides and the, 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 um, the treatment of the vineyard floor. And so we would potentially see that as an impact on our access to those markets and also just the image of, of um, how our vineyards look. So I think it's also probably desirable for, for most of you growers out there that if you can get away from the use of herbicides, well, it's probably a preference as well. So um, there's plenty of, of options out there, but they aren't always good. Um, we can look at cultivation. It's usually slow. It's, um, some of the machines are pretty expensive. They tend to break down um, if they're used in adverse conditions. Steam is another option, but again, it's a, a pretty slow process and quite expensive. And every time we till the soil, we're oxidizing organic matter, which is the way we're trying to move away from rather than we're trying to sequester it rather than oxidize it. Grazing and mowing are, are both also options. They do have their limitations, particularly over the summer period. If you've got um, summer active weeds, it's a, a major exercise trying to keep them under control with, um, with, uh, with grazing or, or particularly um, mowing. Grazing is really only an option there if you've got high trellises and uh, you can keep them in there over that summer period. And mulching is a, a, something which has been undertaken by a lot of people, but um, again, it's, it's fairly expensive, particularly when you get away from the sources of the mulch or the, the compost. Uh, so transport becomes a fairly expensive exercise. So what are the, the ways of going around it? Can we move away from this, this bare soil? So this is a site which we'll be doing some reporting on today at Nuriukpa at the research station. The soils there are inherently fairly sodic anyway. That means they've got fairly high salt contents in them, which means that they are dispersive. They're pretty hard to deal with. And the worst thing you can do is keep them in this bare, bare state. They do need organic matter to try and improve them. Um, so just as a bit of background, Brian Hughes from PERSA did this work in 2014 where he went and surveyed um, vineyards up in the Adelaide Hills, and we can see on the left-hand side about 3% organic matter, organic carbon, I should say, in the, uh, the undervine row where we had grass growing there. And if we take uh, out over a number of seasons, the, uh, the grass growing, we see the third column across the bare undervine row, it's down to you know, um, nearly half of what we saw with the, the grass. So removing that grass really does have an impact on our carbon levels. And we know that carbon is such a, a driver. It's the, the, the engine room of the, the soil that provides all that energy for the, the microbes and so on. It's one of the, the major um, metrics we use for measuring sustainability of our, our, our management of the soil. And that's not the way to go. We can see here at Uri where we've got those highly dispersive soils and the, uh, with the application of water on there, the clay is dispersed, it's blocking up the soil pores and causing the ponding on the surface. But very quickly, if we grow, in this case, a, a medic underneath the vines and allow that medic to just senesce of its own accord, we've got that uh, medic vine remaining on the soil surface, we've generated pores through the soil from having um, plants growing there. And th th this is a, a plot right alongside the last slide and uh, we have infiltration happening immediately. So that's a fairly visible mechanism of uh, seeing the impacts that we can have fairly quickly with undermined cover crops. There are other these options which we talked about with straw and with compost spreading. Um, both work very well and they've been you know, certainly utilized by a lot of people, but they do come at an expense. We're looking at how we can grow our own mulch and how we can produce our own nutrients from cover crops underneath the vine instead. For less than $300 a hectare, we can plant medic and, uh, uh, medic and ryegrass cover crops underneath the vines, whereas uh, these processes cost considerably more and they have to be topped up every few years. So here we are, this is a, a medic and ryegrass cover crop. Um, you can see the, the ryegrass and the medic are both still green um, with the canopy developing there. Uh, but they will very shortly senesce of their own accord. They will die off, they will mulch down. They will have taken out an amount of water in the process of producing all that biomass. But um, as we will see from some of Tom's results to come, we can still produce uh, as good a yields, if not better, uh, at all the sites that we've tried this on um, by having this 
um, undermine cover crop with the right species. And that's a really critical part. You've got to, from our work, uh, you can't go growing perennials there unless you've got a, a, a very high vigor problem with uh, too much moisture in the soil. Otherwise, you've got to go for the self-regenerating annuals, which, which is the nest early in the season. And then bounce back again the following year with the opening rains. There's some wallaby grass, so it does impact on yield too, but it does look good too. The, the way of implementing this is um, I used a, just a quad bike towing the cedar, um, sowing just one row each side of the vine within about 20 centimetres of, of the vine row. And we'll have a look at the, some of the seeding processes in a minute. Just covering the soil with either the press wheel at the back or with uh, a chain behind a disc. Um, minimal disturbance is preferred so that we don't uh, stimulate another weed germination in the process. You can modify conventional cedars and uh, in this case Treasury in the Barossa have done this fairly simple modification to their John Shearer cedar to achieve that same sort of effect. But we do, do need to be careful of making sure the seed doesn't go in too deep. You do need good weed control prior to seeding. The most of these pasture seeds we're using are only fairly small. They don't have big energy reserves, so they don't compete with weeds all that brilliantly early on. So good weed control is good. Um, if you have used in your residual herbicides prior to looking at this under vine cover crop, and you need to make sure that any withholding period has been is recognised because you can uh, run into problems with those residues, particularly with the, the broadleaf species. Uh, being impacted. So you need to uh, spray out those germinants so early if you can and there's good reasons for doing that um, particularly while the soil is is warm to get that early growth uh, away quickly with the, the earliest rains and you can sow dry if you've got a, a, a clean seed bed to, to sow into. It's uh, very useful and um, you can get seed which is pelleted and can sit in the soil for a while and the, and the rhizobium which are attached to the, the seed will stay viable for some time, even though it's in dry soil. Depending on the seed bank, you might need to use some selective control of some revolting weeds that might come up through the, the, um, the sowing cover crop um, by whatever means, it could be mowing, it could be some selective herbicides or whatever. And um, you do need to keep an eye, because we, we've altered the soil biology considerably by removing that vegetation for a long time. And so it does take these plants a while to re-establish and colonize um, these soils. So in the first year, growth can be fairly slow, but be patient, um, it, uh, it, it does happen eventually. So with seeding, I, I suggest to people that they speak to their local agronomist and um, see what varieties grow well in the area, but making sure that you request annual species, so annual grasses, annual legumes, uh, which are also going to mature early. So you don't want to be sucking out moisture too late in the season, but uh, just letting them go through and set lots of seed in that, in that first, first year. And so you've got a seed bank to work with in the future that they will bounce back from. You can, uh, instead of sowing under the vines, if you've got a, a good selection of preferred species in the mid row that are there already, or you can set it up by sowing into the mid row and then throw um, that seed sideways with a, a side throw mower underneath the vines and then you'll have a seed bank from there to work with. That can be a, a pretty cost effective option. But you need to make sure the seed is viable before mowing it. Um, so from our work so far, we, we haven't explored a huge number of um, species options, but it does appear that we can, uh, that the annual pasture legumes and the ryegrass is a, a, the good options to, to start with and they are all readily available from seed merchants at a reasonable sort of a cost. It's not a huge uh, cost impediment. Making sure, you need to make sure those that legumes are inoculated because we've removed the, the vegetation for a long time from underneath the vines and so our, our soil biology needs a bit of uh, support from inoculation. Um, you don't need to, to, to have seed going across that whole undervine area because they will colonize that area of their own accord and just make sure that seeding depth is no more than about a centimetre. So as far as pests or maintenance goes, there are some pests that do, do like to, to chew on these uh, legumes, uh, loosen flea, aphids, red-legged earth mite and so on. So keep an eye on them. But the, the trick is 
to get it in nice and early because they, they require a, a, a chilling requirement or they have a chilling requirement to cause their, their hatching. And um, so long as you can get the plants up and away before things get down to below about 20 degrees, you should be okay. Otherwise you're gonna have to intervene with some insecticides such as alpha cypermethrin to uh, keep them under control. And the beauty of the system is that if you've got the right species, you don't have to go through with herbicide or cultivation or whatever in spring to terminate them. You can let that, that happen naturally uh, or just put, set seed then uh, then collapse down and provide a great mulch on the soil surface all of their own accord. So we're trying to uh, keep the, the costs and intervention down as, uh, as much as possible. There are some limitations though to the system that we found over the years because we did have some other trial sites up in the Riverland and out in the um, Eden Hills area, Eden Valley area as well. But particularly from the Riverland, we found that just on, on our winter rainfall, we weren't able to generate huge amounts of biomass from these species growing underneath the vines. They would grow and they, and they were good, but that what biomass when it collapsed in spring um, wasn't enough to, perform, to provide a really thick, dense mulch like you could with straw to suppress the growth of their major weeds up there, such as fat hen, prickly lettuce, milk thistle, and flea bane. Um, and so you do still need to control those by whatever means um, in spring to make sure they are suppressed with some herbicide or, or whatever. Or, you know, alternatively, what I, there's some great systems up there with people still being able to graze sheep with their high trellises in that area. That can certainly work very well as well. Um, and the other thing is that because we are changing the, the nutrient profile in that undivine area, um, which Tom will show you more of in a minute, we are uh, generating an environment which is very conducive to the grasses moving in. They like to soak up that nitrogen. It's just a natural uh, progression. And so the barley grass and rye grasses and so on do tend to dominate the legumes over time. We haven't with this project had the capacity to to look at um, uh, these systems within a, a grazing regime or with some spring grass seed control as in spraying with a, 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 a selective herbicide or knockdown herbicide in spring to stop that grass seed set and stop that domination. But that's all things to consider. Um, having it dominated by grass is not so bad, but over time that will reduce the amount of nitrogen profile and might, might need to uh, re-sow with some legumes uh, in time. Anyway, I'm going to leave it at that and um, uh, move on to to Tom and um, and uh, he can take it further. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, next up, we'll hear from Dr. Tom Lyons, a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Adelaide with a background in microbiology, plant physiology, and chemical engineering. Tom's more recent work has focused on understanding the complex interactions between undivine plant species and grape production. Tom today will focus on data collection and key findings. So Tom, over to you to make a start. Thanks, Michael. Um, again, thanks everyone for, for coming. And um, it's, it's great to have this opportunity to, um, to talk about the work that we've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, I'm going to go through some of the data that we've collected and uh, talk about the sort of the key takeaways from that. Um, there's, there's so much data that we collected, uh, so I've had to be quite cutthroat in, in deciding what to present here. But um, this is sort of a broad overview of what we have been collecting, um, starting at, the, I guess, at the, the canopy level. We've been looking at um, leaf water potential, leaf area index, so canopy size, looking at the, uh, the nutrient status of the leaves. Um, at harvest, we've looked at bunch sizes and berry weights and berry chemistry and, and yield weights, um, these sorts of things. Then going down to the soil, we've been looking at um, mineralized nitrogen, um, the soil moisture. Uh, we've looked at um, water profiles down to one meter. We've also looked at the, the microbial diversity in the soil. Um, in fact, all of the other soil um, physicochemical um, parameters that you can look at as well. And um, we've done that for quite a number of species of, of undervine cover crops. So you would have heard um, from Chris and Tim 
and seen a few of the examples. Um, so I'll, I'll just take you through them quickly. In fact, on, on this slide here, you can see, um, you can see this is a, a great example of a sort of a senesced medic, um, medic and rye, I think, um, where you get this, this good biomass layer. And because that's a nitrogen fixer, you have that, that um, organic nitrogen breaking down over the season and, and really increasing the amount of available nitrogen throughout the season. Ah, and the other thing that we did was make a bit of wine as well. Um, so we've tried to cover everything and because, you know, you, you know vineyards are such complex systems and when you start adding extra variables like under vine cover crops, um, it just gets even more complicated. So we've tried to measure as much as we can and, and, and learn and fill in the gaps um, in knowledge where, where there have been some. So these are the treatments that we'll be talking about today. They're the ones we've studied. Um, We've got the herbicide control, we have a, a straw mulch, then we have a medic mix, which is just a, a couple of different, different types of medic. Um, and that, um, you know, the, the ones that like the soil more will, um, will dominate the others and, you know, you get something growing there. Then we've got the, the ryegrass and the scimitar medic. Um, that again, that's done really well. I, I'll give you some, some hypotheses about why that is perhaps one of the best, the best um, treatments to use. Then we've got uh, some really competitive grasses. So the Casbah Coxfoot, and I'll be calling that Casbah um, through, through most of the presentation. That is quite a, an aggressive perennial grass. Um, it sort of keeps ticking along through summer and uh, it's quite happy to, to consume any moisture that, that's there. Um, similar to the fescue, the fescue is also fairly competitive, less so than the, the Casbah. And that was also planted with, with strawberry clover um, and so that obviously provided a nitrogen source, the clover, um, and the fescue since then has, has dominated. Uh, and lastly, the wallaby grass, uh, a native grass species. Um, and these, these were established, uh, I think about four years ago. Um, I think that Chris will confirm that that's four years ago. So um, I'll take you through sort of what they look like. So this is, you know, your standard, your standard herbicide under vine. Um, here again is I think probably our medic mix and you can see the sort of recruitment of of other sort of invasive grasses there's some barley grass there there's probably some wild oats around um, and this is early in the season you know just post bud burst and this all does senesce and the benefits seem to um, of the undervine cover crop seem to not limit those vines in any way um, here on the, on the left we've got a, a mulch treatment which has been there for a few years and you can see how it's breaking down really nicely, but, but still providing really excellent um, weed suppression. On the right again is that, um, that green medic and, and rye cover crop. Here's the fescue, ah, oh, sorry, not the fescue, the casbah. Uh, the coxfoot casbah, really aggressive. You can see how big it is there and it holds on and um, really tries to dominate the, the vines. Uh, and lastly, the, the fescue clover mix. You can see a bit of clover, hanging around near the drippers and the fescue does tend to stay green um, wherever there's moisture for as long as it can and often that's through the whole season. Um, that thing in the middle there is our soil moisture probe which goes down to one metre uh, and I'll talk about that soon. And lastly there's an example of uh, a wallaby grass there on the left. Again herbicide on the right. And lastly the, the other undervine not so much a cover crop, but um, cyanobacteria that does often tend to grow when you get a bit of ponding um, under the dripper that you see quite frequently. So that's, that's what we did. And now we can talk about the results. So I just thought I'd, I'd brief people quickly on, on the data that I'm presenting. Um, there are going to be a lot of box pots and if you're not used to seeing them, they can be a bit confusing, but um, they're very similar to bar charts, but they just provide a bit more information. So um, here, you know, you can sort of interpret this as a normal bar chart. You can say, say medic and rye is higher than herbicide in whatever this is. You know, a box plot is much the same, um, but it provides that, that little bit more information about the variability of, um, of the data that we collected. And to make things even more confusing, or perhaps more clear, I'm not sure, um, we've put in the significance. So we've, we've analyzed for statistical significance and if a, um, if a box has a letter above it and that letter is 
the same as one of the letters in another box, you can't say that they're different. So in this case, I would say herbicide is not statistically different from straw mulch. Uh, but if none of the letters are the same, you can say they are statistically significant. So you could say herbicide and straw mulch are statistically significant compared to medic and rice. So I hope that clears things up uh, and I'll get into the data. So I thought the first thing that people might be interested in is looking at yield. And this is, this is the yield from the 2020 vintage. Um, throughout my part of the presentation, uh, on the left here will be the Nuriutpa data, and on the right here will be data from Langhorne Creek. Most of it will be from 2020, unless I, I tell you otherwise. Um, so given that this year yielded very poorly, you can see um, at Nuri, uh, these are Shiraz, Shiraz vines. We only got, well, we got less than two kilos per metre of, uh, of grapes and a similar thing at, at Langhorne Creek uh, for, the, for the Cabernet Sauvignon um, cultivar that we had there. Um, so there were no significant differences at Nuriupa in yield, although you, you might be forgiven for interpreting a sort of trend if you look at the um, competitive grasses. So on the right here, we've got the Casbah, which was that competitive grass, fescue also competitive and wallaby. Wallaby grass being a native grass is great at um, at using water and it's very drought tolerant. So um, you see a similar sort of thing at Langhorn Creek. Herbicide yielded statistically the same as our medic and straw mulch treatments. Um, fescue was the lowest yielding at, at Langhorn Creek. Uh, this, is, this is quite interesting given that it was such a poor, uh, poor year, very dry. Um, and in, in more wet years, you tend to see the, um, the medic and rye doing better, well, doing even potentially better than the, the herbicide. But the key takeaway is these undervine cover crops with the medic uh, are not uh, detrimental to the yield. So after looking at that, one of the other really stark um, and interesting observations that you have if you walk around a vineyard that has these treatments is that the differences in canopy. So we measured leaf area index, which is a, a measure of, of how big the canopy is at, at both sites throughout the season. And um, this was taken in, um, in uh, late February, oh, sorry, early February this year. And you can see that straw mulch uh, tends to have the highest um, the highest canopy size at, at Nuriutpa. Um, and again, the medic and the straw mulch and the herbicide all have quite large canopies compared to the, um, the competitive grass treatments, which really shrink down the, um, the canopy size. So that, that has all sorts of effects. And um, one of the questions that we had and that we were able to sort of explore during this season uh, for the first time was looking at temperature. So we put in some, some temperature loggers. We put in about a hundred actually, and we had, um, we had temperature loggers on the, the soil surface, right at the bottom here, this bottom red star. We had them in the middle of the trunk, and then we had them at cordon height as well. And in analyzing that data, what we did is, is we, we calculated something called total degree days, which is essentially over time, it's, a, it's an accumulation of, of time and temperature. So if, if say, um, a berry experiences higher temperatures for longer, then that might ripen faster, whereas a berry that, that experiences um, lower temperatures for the same amount of time will have a, a lower total degree day value. And we saw interesting, interesting results, but quite different at each site. So at Nuriutpa, which has east-west facing or east-west orientated vines, we saw a, a significantly lower temperature for the straw mulch, which is exactly what you would expect. Um, and not much difference for the others. Um, and they were not st statistically significant. Uh, whereas at Langhorne Creek, we didn't see much of a difference on the ground because these are north-south orientated uh, rows, but we did see a statistical significant difference in the canopy temperature, which is really interesting. So fescue had a, a higher total number of degree days versus the herbicide, the straw mulch and the medic. And that is, well, is, is quite significant. It shows that 
that if you're affecting canopy size, that you're going to affect the, the temperature that the berries are experiencing and, and potentially um, affecting the rate of ripening. So when you look at uh, the berries themselves coming out of this, Oh, sorry, I should have showed you this first. This is, a, this is an infrared um, camera photo of, of the vines at, um, at Nuriukpa on a reasonably hot day. You can see the mid row here is actually 60, 61, 62 degrees and under vine um, where the cover crop is, it's about 35 degrees. So we looked at the, the berry quality and the, the juice chemistry of the grapes from the harvest this year and at both sites, we saw this, this interesting trend with really high pH in the juice for the fescue treatment uh, and, and relatively low pH for the, for the uh, medic and rye and the, the mulch and herbicide, which again, are not statistically significantly different. So herbicide, not different from the medic, but these competitive grasses uh, were having an effect. And I initially, initially thought this might just be due, due to uh, a reduction in canopy size, but because it's occurring at both, at both sites like this, um, the impact of, of fescue is, is sort of quite mysterious. So that will be something um, that we'd like to look at in the future. So juice pH, significantly higher for fescue. Yeast assimilable nitrogen though, this is another important metric in, um, in winemaking. It will decide or help decide whether the winemakers need to add diammonium phosphate. Um, unsurprisingly, but, but significantly, we saw the medic and rye at Nuriupa have a, a really much higher yeast assimilable nitrogen level versus the other treatments. Um, this is because there's a, there's a great uh, supply of nitrogen in the soil and um, the vines are able to use that and, and it accumulates to a certain extent in the, in the berries. We didn't see that at Nuriupa this year, and it's tricky. I think we would have expected to see that. It's, it's possible that the, the grasses in the medic treatments are beginning to use up a lot of the nitrogen, and perhaps um, it's not getting transferred through to the berries, but you still see other differences in, say, the leaf nutrient composition, uh, as well as the soil. So as I said, we looked at soil nitrogen, um, this is total soil nitrogen from, um, from soil samples. So it's not, um, not mineral nitrogen. Uh, it's, it's a similar sort of thing, but, but not exactly the same. So we, interestingly, we see quite a high amount of, um, of nitrogen in the Casbah treatment. I kind of think that might be due to increased um, uh, humic compounds and increased carbon in the soil, increasing the, the residence time of, of nitrogen there at Langhorn Creek, which is um, heavily irrigated. Again, it's a complex system. And um, I think an important takeaway, though it's not really obvious from this, this slide, and perhaps I'll go back, is, is from this slide, is that, that the medic treatments do supply a lot of nitrogen. So as I mentioned earlier, we looked at soil moisture profiles down to one meter. We took these uh, fortnightly. So we have so much data here. I just tried to thin it out a bit. So um, temperatures, uh, sorry, soil moisture sensors every 20 centimeters going down to one meter on the, on the probe. Uh, and so you can see here, this is a, each one of these layers is a different time point, And each one of these columns is a different uh, undervine treatment. And you can see early on in the season, uh, in October, um, quite high water levels. The medic and rye and the fescue, having undervined cover crops, are actually growing and, and are using a bit of that, that moisture in the, the, the upper levels of the soil. But below that, you're still getting good water infiltration and the, the water profile is filling. Um, middle of December now, you can still see perhaps a reduction right at the surface 20 centimetres, uh, but not much difference from there onwards. Uh, and again, yeah, at, at one metre, there's not much difference. And then right towards the end of the season, at, um, on the 24th of, uh, of February this year, 
you can see that that one meter depth has really been depleted by all the vines because it's been dry and hot for a long time and they're they're trying to um to grow the berries and uh it's changing so you, ca you can't see any really big obvious differences so this was nuriutpa and then this is langhorn creek uh, which is slightly different where they have to irrigate a lot more because this, the soil is quite loamy or a sandy loam in some places and it doesn't hold as much water so irrigation has to go on quite heavily through the season um, and again you can see at the end of the season a real depletion of water at, at one meter depth but there's still a fair bit of water in the profile. Another thing we looked at which, uh, which Tim mentioned a couple of times is worms. Um, these are the four most common categories of, of worms. Uh, so we did see significant differences between the, the treatments in terms of worm number. Uh, the, the medic and rye treatment had a significantly higher number of worms than the herbicide treatment. And you can see in general, if there was a cover crop, it was, it was probably a little bit higher than, than the herbicide, though this was not statistically significant. Um, at Langhorn Creek, again, this time wallaby grass had quite a high number of um, of worms relative to herbicide and everything else was somewhere in the middle. Following on from looking at, um, at worms, we can look at the soil microbiome and, and this is uh, a measure of, of bacterial diversity in the soil. Uh, and you can see the Casbar treatment, interestingly, had a significantly higher diversity than the herbicide at Nuriutpa and uh, at Langhorn Creek, um, the medic mix had a higher higher diversity than, than herbicide. And separate from this, and something we didn't study, um, the vertebrate diversity uh, in, in the vineyards was actually noticeable. I don't frequently see a lot of animals in vineyards, but um, we did have a couple of uh, a pigeons deciding to, to lay their eggs in, in one of the treatments. And even this, um, this little bearded dragon was, was um, finding some food in the wallaby grass. So we know the worms are in the soil and, and digesting and breaking things down as are the bacteria and fungi. And this leads on to, to a lot more questions, a lot, and a lot of relevant questions on soil carbon, which, uh, which a PhD student who's just started on this project, Joseph Marx or Joe um, is studying. And you can see here significant differences in total soil carbon where the medic and rye has quite high soil carbon relative to the herbicide. So I hope I haven't swamped you with too many bar graphs or box plots, but um, there are a lot of questions that arise as you look into these sorts of things in terms of soil moisture. What exactly is causing these changes? It's not as simple as having a cover crop is using water or having a mulch is, is protect, uh, preventing evaporation or improving infiltration. There's also effects on, on the vine roots. Uh, are, the, are the vine roots becoming more effective at using the water that's available to them? And, and how is that changing? If the canopy size is getting bigger for the medic, is the, is the root volume also. Um, how are these changes in canopy affecting the ripening? Are, are these differences that we're seeing more ripening effects than anything else? Uh, that would be a good question to answer. And then further questions on, on doing this at a really large scale. Um, I'm sure there's, there's lots of things to be learned by, by doing it this at the, the hectare scale from a, from a management point of view. So to, to summarize um, the effects of these undervine cover crops relative to the herbicide, we saw well, in the, in the 2020 vintage, no change compared to the herbicide with the medic, the medic undervine treatments. We saw higher or, or no change in canopy size compared to the herbicide. Higher soil nitrogen, higher soil carbon with these undervine cover crops. Whereas when we look at the competitive grasses, they really do ruin your yield. They can reduce your canopy size and that can have effects on, on your berries. And uh, reduce the surface water. So I think that is enough and we're going to move to a, uh, a panel discussion. Um, yes, oh, so I'll hand that back to you Michael for a second. 
Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Tom, um, for going through the, the findings associated with these trials. Um, as Tom's mentioned, we're now going to roll into a Q&A. Um, so we've already had a lot of questions come through. Um, we'll do our best to um, address some of these, but um, we may not get to all of them. Um, so we'll start with this one. Um, have you tried spreading seed by mixing with compost and banding under vines? And if you have, what were the results? Can I take that on? Yeah, that's yours, Chris. <laughs> okay. I haven't uh, done it that way. I have heard of people considering it um, as to whether they pursue that, I'm not sure. Um, you would, I guess the, the, the issue there is trying to uh, ensure that the seed is going to an environment which is going to be conducive to germination. And um, if you've got enough compost um, surrounding the seed and giving it enough insulation, I suppose, from drying out too quickly, um, it should work fairly effectively. But it'd be a, a bit of a hit and miss exercise, um, but certainly worth considering. Yeah, I, I would, um, I would encourage it, certainly. Okay, thanks, Chris. Another one here for you. You refer to sowing an early maturing species. Can you specify how early is early? Yeah, so um, there's, there's some medic varieties out there which um, only take about 80 days from, um, from sowing to, or from, from germination to flowering, um, which is a, a pretty short period. Um, the, we're very fortunate to have such a, an array of partial species available to us, which have been bred over the years by particularly Sardi. And, uh, and so we can access these and uh, they are very compatible with what our requirements are in the vineyards. So yes, we need to, to try and get them, as that, that photo uh, showed of the, uh, the rye grass still looking pretty green with a, an early a canopy and fairly early development stages. Uh, you don't want it to be, you know, well, it depends very much on your own particular environment, um, but we don't want to be sucking out moisture for any longer than we have to. So getting the, getting one uh, a, a medic or clover species, which is going to work well in your environment is number one, and two, getting them which are going to mature as early as possible. And, uh, and hopefully your local agronomist would have that, uh, that information available to them. Otherwise, uh, get in touch and we can help you through that. Okay, thanks. I think this one might be for you as well, Chris. Are you aware of any work that's been done on mixing into these seed mixes plant species which attract beneficial insects to the vineyard? Um, I'm not at the moment. Um, I think certainly people like uh, Mary Retallick uh, have done work on um, what on enhancing biodiversity in the vineyards and how we might go about that. And wallaby grass uh, came up um, as being a, a very desirable species to, to have within it. But as, um, as we've seen, it can be fairly detrimental to, to, to productivity. So my preference for wallaby grass, and I think it's a, a wonderful species to have in the vineyard, but I think in most of our situations, it'd be better suited to a mid-row cover crop rather than under vine, and uh, where it's not going to have such an impact on the, the vine yield and we might only want to plant it every 10 rows or so to, to still get those benefits of biodiversity enhancement and habitat um, without um, the, the costs of sowing it over a complete vineyard, which is, is fairly expensive because the seed is, is pretty expensive. Um, and so, yes, I, I think there's certainly a room for addition of other species in there within the research work was somewhat, uh, was going to complicate things too much to, to go down that route. Um, but things like alyssum, uh, psyllium, and some of those uh, certainly um, do have a, a role there, but at pretty low uh, plant densities, I would suggest you don't need a lot to provide that, that habitat for the, the beneficials. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, so Lynn has reported that in years that they've left um, grasses to grow, they've had significant loss of leaf and bunches um, due to weevils um, and the question is she would like to have a cover crop but is concerned about giving weevils a ladder to the canopy what do you suggest in this scenario 
I, I haven't heard of that issue before. Um, yeah, I, I'm not, not sure how to deal with that one. Um, whether if you were able to, if you had sheep grazing there, for instance, if you're able to knock that, uh, that cover crop down further, so it was uh, uh, laying on the, the soil surface rather than providing that ladder, I, I'm, I haven't um, had to deal with it. I'm, I'm sorry, Lynn. Um, yeah, it'd be, be good to think about it some more and as to how we could, uh, could work on it. Well, sure. One thing, one thing I might add there as well is the, the growth and development of invertebrates is very much tied to the number of degree days that they experience. So reducing the number of degree days um, through the different management practices might have some benefit. I don't, I don't think it would stop the problem, but it would certainly um, go some way to making it a little bit more challenging for the weevils. Great, thanks for your input there, Tim. Um, does undervine growth affect botrytis risk in humid environments? That has been suggested as a concern by some people I've spoken to, but others um, have said that they don't see it as, as being a, an issue, and particularly with these species which we're recommending, which are going to be senescing and just providing a mulch on the surface. I don't think it's going to be any different to having a straw mulch there. Yep, thanks Chris. Um, what depth were the soil samples taken and were, removed, or were roots removed from these samples? Yeah, they were, they were taken um, zero to 10 centimetres, so soil surface. Um, and yeah, if there were, if there were roots that we found, we, we pulled them out. Okay. Can I and add really quickly to that? The, the ongoing work that Joe's doing, um, looking at soil carbon stocks, that's going down to 30 centimetres, so zero to 10, 10 to 30. Um, so we can then look at that in the context of um, carbon farming. Yeah, that will give us a much, a much better idea of exactly what, where the carbon is in terms of what state and, and, and how it's sitting in there. Um, yeah, the, the soil carbon that I presented there was just a real, you know, quick soil sample and send it off. But um, yeah, we're, we're certainly, well, Joe is, is looking, looking uh, into that in more depth. Sure, okay. Um, how old were the vines used in the study? Both sites are in excess of 20 years old. Yep. Um, I've got a question here about when does nitrogen from medics become available to other plants? Yep, I, I can answer that one. And th there was a question above that too about the difference between total and mineral end. So I can probably answer both at once. Yeah, go for it, Tim. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so um, total nitrogen is as it sounds, it's all of the nitrogen in the soil. So it's ammonium, nitrate, nitrite, um, proteins, amino acids, N from geologic sources. So it's really a snapshot of all the N that's in the soil. Mineral N is a term that we use for the, um, the ammonium and the nitrate together. So the plant available forms. So it's, yeah, it's really what's available to the plant. That, that mineral form. Um, in terms of when does it become available? Yeah, really it's when the, um, the residues from the plants, when they die off and decompose and microbes go to work and they release that nitrogen and they convert it from the organic form in the, the dead roots and leaves and exudates and whatever that may be into a, a mineral form, so ammonium and nitrate. Okay. Um, do you suspect there'll be better results with the grasses versus the control for second season if you were performing the same trial? Uh, look, I'm happy to field that one. This, okay. We have run this trial for um, a few years now. So these, these are very well established um, undermine cover crops. So, so we wouldn't expect to see better results for, for the grasses specifically. Um, that I think they're, they're fairly stable and um, the, the competitive problems that, that the, these grasses specifically are, are causing are sort of have been consistent. Um, so we, we don't expect to see um, an improvement over time. Sure. I think we're just, while, while we're on that, I just think we need to, to clarify so between the, the grasses. So we've got perennial and annual grasses. The annual grasses are nowhere near as competitive as what the perennials are. I, I, I did see a, a, a question come up there a moment ago, or a, 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 a thought coming from one of the participants 
suggesting that perennial grasses can be sprayed out and uh, with a, you're probably using a, uh, something like paraquat to spray them out. And, and we haven't tried that. I have um, done it with, um, with mowing the tops of the grasses, trying to cut back, cut back on transpirational area. And they were still very um, competitive and reduced yield by doing that. Maybe with spraying out, they would um, that uh, that could be um, more effective at uh, reducing that competitiveness. So, but the other thing is the perennial grasses are also not only competitive against the vines, but they're also very competitive against other weed species as well. So I think there's still work to be done there on how we can can accommodate them within the vineyard, keep the weeds out, um, particularly in the, the riverland type areas. And, uh, and still get uh, good yields. Okay, thanks, Chris. We've just got a question here about what method and when um, counting of worms occurred. Do you want to go on that, Tom? Yeah, yeah, sure. So we, we took um, a number of 15 kilo soil samples from, um, from each plot. Uh, and so, yeah, the, our worm counts were from 15 kilo samples uh and when did we take them L early october was it Chris? no 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 much earlier than that oh, um, was it, was it September? july august july okay oh yeah okay so it was the soil was still wet um and the worms were all in the in the surface at that time but, those, yeah, we those the worms were we taken to the top 10 centimeters um so we, we're only getting a portion of the total worm numbers but they were still pretty uh, pretty high compared to um, some standards on that. Okay. Um, question about establishing a vineyard. When would you suggest planting medics if someone was doing that? Would it be in year one or would you do that at a later stage? I, we, we've gone through, thought about this before. And I think as a, to generate a good mulch that the medics could work very well and, and getting them established um, at the same time or the year prior to planting a vineyard could work very well, I think. So long as suggestions like Lynn had there before with things like weevils, um, we don't want to have them uh, act as an attractant to some of those uh, more deleterious insect species which could impact on that, that um, initial establishment. So you might just have to be a little bit wary about that, but I don't know of any other concerns in that area. Chris? I, I just add that I've heard people express concerns about, you know, establishing a vineyard with, with cover crops present and that may be out competing the, the juvenile vines as they're, as they're becoming established. And I, I don't think that's really been answered yet. I think, you know, the counter argument could be that, that if you have a cover crop that it's actually going to encourage a vine to, to develop deeper, deeper root systems. Um, and, you know, perhaps medic as well. I didn't mention this earlier, but, you know, I, I kind of, I have this theory that maybe the medic root system is larger than the other, you know, say herbicide systems, uh, herbicide treatments. Um, and so that, that nitrogen that is available, um, that allows bigger canopy production and, and you know, more sugar production, uh, the, the, the vines are putting that somewhere and I think they might be potentially increasing the, the root mass. So it's it's hard to know. I, I think that's the, the answer. We would, don't really know. Sure. Okay, question here about whether you measured heat transfer inside the canopy. Uh, no, we didn't measure that. We just had the loggers in there. Um, it would be, uh, that would be the next thing I do, I think, if we were running it again this season, I'd love to look at, at irradiation as well from the from the ground or reflectance from the ground, um, as well as humidity and other things. But um, yeah, sure. so we just got those loggers. And also a question about whether the straw was sterilised before it was spread. No, it wasn't sterilised. It was um, straight from the paddock. But it was so long as um, you know, when the straw is is um, cut after harvest, which the, the farmers tend to do these days after using a stripper front, there's very little contamination that, that goes into the straw in the way of weed seeds. And we had very little germinate from that, uh, that straw mulch. Okay. Um, 
what is the persistence of the medic going to be like with mixed when mixed with a perennial grass? I think I've asked that correctly. <laughs> um, it depends on the perennial grass, but chances are um, the perennial is going to uh, provide too much competition for, for the medic. Um, depending on, on plant spacings and that sort of thing as to, the, as to how much competition there, there is. But certainly in, in our trials with fairly dense plantings, there was not much room for anything else to grow there besides the, the perennial grass. Yep. Um, and are you able to comment on what extra irrigation should be budgeted for when um, using a cover crop versus a, a herbicide option? I think we would, would probably say none really needs to be budgeted for if you're using these these annual grasses and, and annual um, legumes. Um, we have we've only seen higher you know, larger canopies or or the same or higher yield with exactly the same irrigation. So we did maybe we didn't mention that, but there's there was no extra irrigation provided to the cover crops versus the herbicide, and um, yeah, these results were sort of were from 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 that um, that irrigation re regime. Thank you. Know. Go on. Uh, yeah, a relevant point there is this thing set up as a, a randomised block design, and the irrigation is left to the the vineyard manager. So we're not there's no intervention from us. It's it's what they would get. So did you have any feedback around whether they used or saved water as a result of these trials? I, th I think that gets to the point that Tom made earlier that I think the next big step in this is to do it on a much larger scale. So we, we don't have that, that fine scale resolution data on, on the water use. But if you could do this on a, a block scale, I think that would really answer what's quite an important question. Okay. I think too, when, when going forward, with this and it's not something we've had the opportunity to do but again going at that larger scale would be really good and certainly from a lot of conversations with growers soil moisture or competition for soil moisture it seems to be a, a major concern understandably my take on that is that once these undermine cover crops are established and you've got a, a big seed bank on the soil surface that's uh, been enabled there from allowing them to go through the seed set every year, especially in the establishment years, then if growers are concerned with having dry seasons like we've had in the past and, and soil moisture uptake occurring, um, then you can take out the, the cover crops, but you're gonna have a seed bank there still um, sitting in situ waiting for the next season when the opening rains come along and they'll bounce back again. So, um, uh, we have that flexibility then once you've got a decent seed bank to uh, to manage it for future years, you know, depending on the season. Okay. Um, we've got a lot more questions, so we'll push on for a little while longer. If, if any of the panel members do need to leave for whatever reason, then just please speak up. Um, we've got a question here around whether the increased risk of bushfire damage um, due to cover crops um, recently, or the increased risk of bushfire lately, has been considered with relation to using cover crops? I can speak a little bit there. Um, so we do have a, a small project at the moment, some work we're doing with Cass Collins and, and some other people as well, looking at some sites that were affected by, um, by the recent bushfires. And I've also had some conversations with various people who, who've been working in those areas. And the the comments that I got back were if the fire got in there, it really, you know, if it's a big intense fire, if it got in there, it, it went through it, whether or not you had that undervine um, vegetation there or not. I, I could see that if you had, um, you know, a low intensity fire, then yeah, potentially it could spread through that region. But if it, if it's a big bushfire bearing down on the vineyard, I, I'm not sure that that's going to have a big um impact but again i think that's a really important question so i'm, I'm being quite cautious in how i answer that because i think it's a bit of an unknown um but that that's the anecdotal evidence that I've, I've heard so far from people okay thanks tim um what do you think about the possibility of using mixes with a larger number of species and a mix of annual and perennial legumes along with winter active and or summer dormant grasses i very much encourage multiple species within the mix. 
um, to try and ensure that you have something growing every year, because uh, given the, the 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 biology of these um, of the species we're working with, some will grow in some years, some have you know, are, are quite hard seeded, and so they they, they uh, won't necessarily germinate the year straight after they've uh, set seed. Um, some can be quite soft seeded. Um, and so having a, a, a wider variety of species within a mix is really good. But again, I do caution against the use of the perennial grasses in particular, um, probably more so than perennial legumes. Um, well, no, let's take that out. Um, I, I wouldn't have anything like lucerne in the, the mix uh, as an undervine cover crop, unless um, in a situation like we're doing the riverland where we've got some real uh, issues with uh, soil strength in that undermine area. Um, very, very tight soil, so root um, activity is really suppressed and we're trying uh, some cover crops such as lucerne and chicory in the undermine zone to try and use a, a biological drilling mechanism to try and loosen up those soils rather than having to, to come in with a ripper. But in, the, in most situations though, I really do discourage people from going for perennials in that undermine zone. But um, a good mix of species, so as long as they are ones that you think are going to be suitable, is a really good idea. Okay. Um, are you aware of any trials that have been conducted in cool climate areas like Orange? And second part of this is uh, we need airflow during the season to help with humidity late season, so need something that's low growing. Any comments or suggestions around that? We did uh, have a, a site uh, originally at Eden Valley, so higher rainfall, cooler climate there, and um, we are, we're only unfortunate, unfortunately we're only able to, to keep that going for one year. Um, we'll get one year's worth of yield data out of it, and uh, and there was no issues there with suppression of yield. It worked very well. Um, that site is, is still there, but it's um, for the most part been overrun now by, by grasses because of, there's been no management there at all. Um, and I don't see any other any other issues there, but it, it does uh, reflect a requirement for um, looking carefully at the species you use in the cooler climates. You are going to be probably looking more at clover species rather than medics uh, if you're higher rainfall and probably uh, acidic soils as well. Okay. Um, have you got any thoughts or comments around compost? as a mulch compared to these cover crop strategies, um, both in terms of economics as well as long-term? Um, I guess I'll go again. Um, compost is a fantastic product, but uh, you know, it's expensive. Looking at sort of three and a half, four thousand dollars a hectare to apply it. You can get long-term benefits from it. And some trials in the past have shown that up to seven years or so down the track, even you know, when the, the, the compost has completely disappeared from the soil surface, you're still getting benefits from its prior application. Um, so it depends on, on, um, on people's own individual philosophy as the way they want to go, um, if, whether they're willing to, to have that upfront cost or whether they prefer to go down the track that, which we are suggesting we're letting um, biology in the form of plant life provide many of those same benefits that the compost can supply. You can't, it's difficult to apply compost heavily enough within a, a reasonable budget to get weed control from it. That's really the nutritional I'd in there, Chris. From it. Otherwise you, you might provide, go for a coarse compost, a very coarse product, which has not got the same level of nutrients, but get some, uh, weed control if you can put it on thickly enough but we're trying to get that weed control from competition and from um, from emulsion effect if i could just jump in there chris um i was lucky enough to run a trial down in padkaway over this last season and um one of the things that we trialed was was compost and straw mulch as a combination and you know you, you save to a certain extent you save on having to use purely compost to cover the entire undervine area, but you still get really great weed suppression and you get really good benefits from that. Um, the cost is, is obviously still there, but um, we had, had quite good results. Um, and I'm wondering whether that might be 
a way that people could actually approach getting into cover cropping on a longer term scale, depending on, on what they've got in the undervine. But if they have existing weeds as a problem and they don't want to spray, perhaps they're trying to move towards an organic system um, as soon as possible, they could potentially use straw and or compost as an initial method for um, removing weeds from the undervine area and then plant into that as that, as that degrades. Um, it's just an idea. I don't think we've tried that, but um, yeah. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, I've had someone here with issues with red-legged earth mites um, that is not allowed to use insecticide to counter this issue. Do you have any recommendations around um, how they may be able to control this? A tricky one. Um, um, I have come across an organic grower, um, not in, in vineyards, but uh, in pastures, who was having success with a fish emulsion for red-legged earth mite. So whether it's the odour or whatever turns them off, I don't know. Um, but yes, they, the, the red legs can be certainly very decimating if, uh, if they can get away and there aren't much in the way of organic uh, insecticides. You might might get away, might have some benefit from some like neem oil in there. Um, I'm not sure what else you could try. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, perhaps contact the AWRI help desk with that one. Uh, grasses are bacterial dominant. Did you test fungal populations in these trials? Yeah, I can, I can probably have a go at that one. Um, so yeah, we, we did look at the, the whole soil microbiome. So we looked at, we used, um, and there's some other questions that relate to this as well. So we, we extracted DNA from the soil and then we did some high throughput sequencing and looked at the 16S community. So that's the bacteria and the archaea. And we also looked at the ITS community. So the fungal communities as well. Um, Another aspect of that, we've looked at the impacts of the different treatments on the formation of mycorrhizal associations, so um, beneficial soil fungi. Um, and so we've got some, some data on that as well. So yeah, we, we've tried to take a whole of soil microbiome approach and look at the, the diversity at the, the bacterial and the archaeal and the fungal levels. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, there's quite a few questions still in um, the Q&A, so I don't think we're going to get to all of them. I know the panel has suggested they're happy to follow up these questions post um, or after the webinar. We might make this one the la uh, this the last question, um, and it's around the use of native ground covers and whether you've considered using native ground covers um, in trials. Any recommendations, suggestions, comments there? Um, I've done, done work in the past with uh, looking at native cover crops and uh, there is a, a fact sheet on the Wine Australia website if um, people want to have a, a look at the outcomes from that work. Um, just in, in brief though, uh, most of those that I was working with uh, were perennials and I would not be recommending them for this work for the undervine area, but certainly some of the prostrate salt bushes and some of the, the grasses as well, as I mentioned before, I think are very um, suitable for use in the mid row area. Okay, as I suggested, I don't think we're gonna to get to all those questions. There's been a an awful lot of interest and, and um, questions that have come through. So I do appreciate um, the audience sending them in. Um, as I, yes. Sorry, just, could I just interrupt? I didn't put up a, a slide, but uh, um, there is a fact sheet on this undervine cover cropping that Jake Howie and I put together last year, which is on the, the Wine Australia website as well. So a, a Google of undervine cover cropping in Wine Australia, we'll soon find that for participants if they're interested. Yep, excellent. Thanks, Chris. We'll, we'll make sure that's circulated in the post session notification or emails that go out to, to attendees. Um, I believe a range of resources around cover crops was also added into the uh, webinar page on the AWRI website. So if you wanna um, have a look at some of those resources then do visit our website. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to extend a, a really big thank you to 
Chris, Tom and Tim for uh, coming in and sharing insights into the benefits associated with undervine cover, cover cropping. It's fantastic to have um, all of you join today's session and share results. And there's been some really positive um, feedback from the audience around the session. So much appreciated and, and big thanks to you all. Um, I'd also like to extend a thank you to the audience for logging in and for also um, sharing your questions and comments. Um, attendees will receive a follow-up email with a, um, a link to the recording of this session. So you will be able to rewatch um, via the AWRI's YouTube channel. Um, acknowledgements also to Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. Um, the next AWRI webinar takes a look at winery remediation options for smoke affected juice and wine and is scheduled for Thursday, the 23rd of July. The speaker is Dr. Julie Colbert. Thank you again for joining and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.